With reference to the previous lectures, the two points to make here with relationship to Lenin, I'll be giving you the first example of how it is Lenin claims we have gotten rich by stealing from other countries, and also in the background how everything in a capitalist country, including and especially the government, is run by and for the rich, not by and for the people. But perhaps even more importantly, I will be trying to explain the terrible state of relations between especially our country, the United States, and the country of Iran, of course, oil-rich, militarily powerful, strategic geographical position, holds much of the land bridge between the Middle East and the Far East, working on nuclear weapons. We wish they would stop. As I'm lecturing here, Trump just broke the nuclear proliferation treaty with Iran. And George Bush, after 9-11, called Iran part of the axis of evil. Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. We've taken care of Iraq. Good luck with North Korea. We call them part of the axis of evil. They call us the great Satan. Obviously, we don't like each other very much. But that wasn't always true. I am old enough to remember back when a fellow named the Shah was in control. S-H-A-H. -H. Really, that's just a title that means king. His real name, if you need to know, was Mohammed, of course. Ritza Pahlavi, but I will just call him the Shah. When he was in control until 1979, Iran was one of our closest allies in the world, centerpiece of our Arab Middle Eastern policy. I've become aware, of course, for your generation, our two countries have always been hostile enemies, but not back when I was growing up until 1979. I was 28 years old. Iran was our close ally. Then it all ended when the people of Iran rose up in that furious revolution, kicked the Shah out of power, kicked him out of the country, invaded the American embassy, took our embassy diplomats, held them as hostage for over one year, 444 days. Front page news in every newspaper in the United States, Walter Cronkite couldn't go off the air without telling us exactly how many days it had been that Iran had humiliated us. And so if the media has done its job, we should all have some idea why this occurred. I will try to suggest the media has not done its job. The media is run by the rich. Although for many of you, of course, you're not old enough to remember the media coverage, so for the younger people it would be the school system. If the school system had done its job, we should have some some idea what's really gone on here. School system didn't do its job, of course. Run by the government, elected by the rich, but it all centers around the overthrow of this guy, the Shah of Iran. Who is he? Where did he come from? When did he take power? How did he take power? Why do the people of Iran hate him so much? They rose up in a furious revolution, kicked him out. How are we involved that they invade the American embassy, call us the great Satan, hate us also? To tell the story, U.S. <coughs> relations with Iran, and I always like to title this after this headline from the Union Tribune, Iran. The Roots of Terror. Story begins, say, around the turn of the 20th century, time of World War I. Who is in control of Iran? <clears throat> not the people of Iran. They do not control their own country. Iran generally is a colony of England. Oh, Russia has a piece in the north. Turkey has a piece in the north. Generally speaking, though, Iran is a colony of England. England, of course, had by far the largest colonial empire. Not just Iran, most of the rest of the Middle East also. And the British remained in control of their colony, Iran, until 19. 
year that I was born. The British withdraw from Iran, 1951, allow the people of Iran to have free democratic elections. And the reason the British withdraw from Iran in 1951, not to be nice and let the colony have its freedom. Oh, we're British, we're European, we believe in freedom. I guess we should let the colony have freedom. The British didn't give us our freedom. They taught you that story. We had to fight them for our freedom. The reason Iran does not have to fight England for its freedom, what has happened to England in the years just prior to their withdrawal from Iran in 1951, World War II is only recently ended, ends in 1945, just six years before they withdraw from their colony in Iran, and I'm presenting this as cause and effect. In World War II, England's military power was smashed. Germany destroyed England. Germany bombed the daylights out of England. England, with American help, returned the favor. We bombed the daylights out of Germany. We destroyed Germany. France was in the middle. They were destroyed also. All the European colonial powers destroyed each other in World War II, fighting over their colonies, as I made plain in the war communism lecture, Lenin's plan to conquer the world, fighting over their colonies. And so the British realized, as a result of having their military strength destroyed in World War II, they no longer had the military strength required to hold on to colonies in the far-flung regions of the world. So the British pulled out of their colonies, mostly peacefully. In the late 1940s, they pulled out of their colony in India under pressure from, oh, what was the name of that guy again? Gandhi. Of course, how could I forget? See the movie Gandhi, one of the great movies ever made, one of the most amazing human beings who has ever lived. The British withdraw from Iran in 1951, the rest of their colonies in Asia and Africa. Singapore, the last one to go in 1964, I believe, unless you want to count Hong Kong, which I do, that the British gave back to the communist Chinese at the turn of the millennium. But from this point of view, you, the British are smarter than the French. No big surprise to those who know the European history, the French apparently do not realize how World War II has smashed their military, that as a result France no longer will have the power to hold on to their colonies all over the world. The French tried to use their military to continue to hold on to their colonies all over the world, and the French are dealt a bitter and bloody and humiliating defeat in which former French colony the name should be familiar to the American people. I'm referring, of course, to Vietnam, what was called French Indochina, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, they taught you that story, Ho Chi Minh and the commies kicked the French out. We moved in to take the place of the French, did they teach you that story, Ho Chi Minh and the commies kick us out also. Maybe from that point of view the British were smarter than the Americans, maybe I'll get to do that lecture sometime in the future. But now, 1951, the British pull out, allow the people of Iran to have free elections. The people of Iran democratically elect the central figure in the drama. <clears throat> Virtually nobody here has ever heard of. Everybody in Iran knows who he was. His name, of course, Mohammed. And I had a student ask me, by the way, how come so many of them are named Mohammed? I said to her, well, how come so many Mexicans are named Jesus? She said to me, my boyfriend is named Jesus. And so his name, Mohammed Mossadegh, the way I will pronounce it, Mossadegh, Mossadegh, M-O-S-S-A-D-E-G-H. And I've had students from Iran. I remember I said to one guy, have you ever heard of Mohammed Mossadegh? He said to me, oh yes, great patriot, great hero. I had a female who went to university in Iran. I said to her, have you ever heard of Mohammed Mossadegh? And she said, yes, so quickly. I thought she hadn't heard the end of my question. I thought I was just asking her if she had heard of Mohammed. Of course, that would be a stupid question to ask a Muslim, but I wanted to make sure we were on the same page, so I repeated my question more slowly. Have you ever heard of Mohammed Mossadegh? And she kind of got angry and snapped at me and said, of course I have. I went to school. Everybody there knows who he is. Nobody here knows who he was. Time Magazine's Man of the Year, by the way, in 1951. And when they invade the American Embassy in 1979, 
and Mosadak is long since dead. He dies of old age under house arrest in the 1960s. When they invade the American Embassy in 1979, they hang Mosadak's picture right by the doorway to the American Embassy as their way of telling the world this is why we did it. This is what's really going on. So when any newspaper person from any part of the world would walk into the American Embassy and say to the people of Iran, why did you take the American Embassy? Why did you take American diplomats as hostage? They just pointed to Mossadegh's picture by the door and said, that's the reason why. This is the reason why. And I've learned that and much of my material from this great book by the great scholar Stephen Kinzer called All the Shah's Men, the subtitle very relevant here, An American Coup and the Roots of Middle East Terror. The story I'm about to tell you about Mossadegh is the Roots of Middle East Terror. And the reason the people of Iran elect Mossadegh to be their leader, the spirit of his campaign, the slogan I always made up for him, Iranian oil for the Iranian people. From the movie Argo, the first few minutes, by the way, is all about what happens with Mossadegh. Argo says his slogan was, to return Iran's oil to its people. Iranian oil for the Iranian people, return Iran's oil to its people. And I've had students think what that meant was the actual oil, that Mossadegh wanted to return the oil to the people. He didn't want any of the oil leaving the country. He wanted all the oil to stay in the country and return it to its people. An obvious misreading of modern economics. Iran is not a heavily industrialized country. They do not use that much oil themselves. They are sitting on top of a huge ocean of oil. It would take them hundreds, maybe thousands of years to use it all themselves. And so it's the profits, of course, the profits generated by the sale of Iran's oil should go to the treasury of the country of Iran. It's their oil serve the needs and interests of the people of Iran. Because prior to this time, who was getting the profits generated by the sale of Iran's oil? The British, of course. This was the true name of the game of British colonialism, as we Americans, a former British colony ourselves, must surely realize what was England's policy towards us when we were their colony. Tax, tax, tax the daylights out of the colonies, squeeze them good, take everything they got and make them scream. That's what the British were doing in Iran as well. Except in Iran, the name of the game of British colonialism wasn't taxation. The people of Iran were dirt poor. They had virtually nothing to tax. In Iran, the name of the game of British colonialism, steal Iran's oil, steal the world's most valuable resource. And so Mossadegh realized Iran has only two natural resources in great abundance, oil and sand. The British are rapidly taking all of the oil. The day is going to come when Iran has only sand left. That, of course, will be a very sad day, not bode well for their future. Sand is worthless in the international marketplace. And so what Mossadegh wanted to do was divert the bulk of the profits from where it had been going into the treasuries of the Western oil companies. By now, the Americans are in the Middle East as well, same as in South East Asia, why I wanted to mention that. France, of course, smashed by World War I and World War II. They're withdrawing from their colonies. The United States, not so smashed. We move in to take the place of the French. Same thing in the Middle East. The British smashed by World War I and World War II. They're withdrawing from their colonies. The United States, not so smashed. We're moving in to take the place of the British. And so divert the profits from where it had been going when the I, people of Iran were a colony of England into the treasuries of the Western oil companies, divert that money, those profits, into the treasury of Iran, serve the needs and interests of the people of Iran. But how do the Western oil companies feel about Mossadegh doing this, diverting the bulk of the profits from the treasuries of their oil companies, their bank accounts, their pockets, into the treasury of his country, Iran? How do the Western oil companies feel about that? A. Favorably. 
B. Neutral. C. Unfavorably. Correct answer. C. Unfavorably. They want the profits for themselves. They want the money for themselves. Of course, like it always had been when Iran was a colony of England. And so the next step in the unfolding of this historical drama, the Central Intelligence Agency, that branch of the American government involved in spying on foreign countries, they move in, figure out a way to violently overthrow the democratically elected government of Mohammed Mossadegh. That's called a coup, C-O-U-P, French word means blow, coup d'etat, an overthrow of the government, CIA, moves in, kicks out the democratically elected leader, Mohammed Mossadegh, installs a U.S.-friendly puppet, the Shah, and the person who does this, the head of the CIA, back in 1953, Mossadegh was in office for two years, we tolerated him for two years, 1953, the CIA kicks him out, head of the CIA, I always like to have some student guests, J. Edgar Hoover, so I can point out, no, he was the head of the FBI, that's the branch of government that spies on us, the head of the CIA, branch of the American government spies on foreign countries, the very famous Alan Dulles, his brother was the Secretary of State, cabinet level position in charge of foreign affairs, and one of the most famous secretaries of state ever, secretary of state for the entirety of the Eisenhower administration. Eisenhower never replaced him. John Foster Dulles and the main airport serving the Washington DC Baltimore area, Dulles International Airport, is named for the for his famous Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, think he must have been an important person if the airport in Washington, D.C. is still named after him. So these two brothers, Alan Dulles, head of the CIA, spies on foreign countries, John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State, capital level position in charge of foreign affairs, they're running American foreign policy. Eisenhower is the president, of course, what was Eisenhower most famous for doing while he was president? Nothing is the answer I us usually like to get, although once a student mentioned the interstate highway system, how could I forget? And I'm old enough to remember, but the answer I was looking for was playing golf. And I once had a student yell that out, and I thought to him, I said to him, how could you know that? I'm barely old enough myself. And he said, well, professor, I'm on the men's golf team here at San Diego State, and I was born and raised in Palm Springs, and I have played every golf course in Palm Springs. And at every golf course in Palm Springs, as you walk onto the course, there's a plaque that reads Eisenhower played here. And then I was watching the Masters Tournament out of Augusta, Georgia, on the 17th hole, very famous famous tree hangs over the fairway called the Eisenhower tree. Eisenhower hit the tree so often he asked the country club to cut it down. Obviously doesn't understand the role of hazards in golf. The tree blew down, by the way, just a year or so ago in one of the big storms they had in the southeast, not related to climate change, of course, and they're thinking of planting a new one, but they're not sure. But in any case, to some extent, this is just standard managerial strategy. You appoint competent underlings to do the job, and if the underlings are competent and are doing a good job, you got nothing to do. So Eisenhower's out on the golf course, the Dulleses, John Foster and Allen, running American foreign policy. The crucial historical detail here, both Dulleses, Allen and John Foster, before they went to work for Eisenhower, writing American foreign policy, before Eisenhower was elected in 52 and selected them to run American foreign policy, before 1952, back when they were civilians, they were in charge of one of the most prestigious Wall Street law firms named Sullivan and Cromwell, big Wall Street law firm, Wall Street, stock market, banks, oil companies, Sullivan and Cromwell, the Dulleses, they did international law, they represented all the big American 
corporations, especially the oil companies. These guys are oil company lawyers running American foreign policy. How do the oil companies get their lawyers to run American foreign policy? My lawyers don't run American foreign policy. Do your lawyers run American foreign policy? How do the oil companies get their lawyers running American foreign policy? I hope it's obvious, of course, as I have tried to argue in preceding lectures, the rich, the oil companies, the banks, they put up the money for Eisenhower's campaign. The rich, the corporations, the oil companies, the banks, they put up the money for all the campaigns. And so the oil companies must have said to Eisenhower, hey, Eisenhower, can we make our lawyers in charge of foreign policy? Eisenhower must have said, hey, I'm out on the golf course, do what you want. And so oil company lawyers running American foreign policy, need I point out nowadays, lawyers do anything to serve the interests of their client, even if what the client is doing is illegal. It's the job of the lawyer to protect the client. Maybe even if what the client is doing is immoral, it's the job of the lawyer to protect the client. And so oil company lawyers kick out the democratically elected Mohammed Mossadegh, whose only crime is that he wanted to use Iran's wealth and oil for the people of Iran. It's their oil, after all, who he had his nerve. The oil companies hated him. Him. So they get their lawyers, the Dulleses, running foreign policy, kick out Mohammed Mossadegh, violent overthrow of his government, and install the Shah as a U.S. friendly dictator. He will be on the oil company team. He was installed by oil company lawyers. You wouldn't install somebody who wasn't going to be on your team, would you? Initially, the Shah keeps the price of oil very low way below what would be fair market prices so the oil companies can make a lot of money without having to charge us a lot of money. We all benefit, very important sentence here, we all benefit by paying much less than fair market prices for oil and gasoline. Oil and gasoline, of course, main lubricant of modern industrial economies. Cheap oil, cheap gas, main lubricant of the traditionally wasteful American lifestyle, the Shah also becomes a multi-billionaire, same as with Chiang Kai-shek. We make sure that the Shah becomes spectacularly wealthy himself, so it will be well worth his while to be a traitor to his people, play ball with the oil companies, the people of Iran, get nothing. They're cut out of the deal. They get screwed, same as when the British were in control. And if anyone complains about this, of course, obviously they would. They're going to be poor forever. Their children are going to be poor forever. Complain that we did this to them. They are taken away, tortured, and killed by the Shah's terrible secret police acronym from the Persian named Savak. S-A-V-A-K. I don't speak Persian, though I've had students Google it. Savak must have killed a great many people in Iran. The evidence I tried to use to support those claims, simply the size and fury of the demonstrations in Iran in 1979 when the Shah was overthrown and they invaded the American embassy. How many Iranians showed up to complain about the Shah's government? A. Hundreds. B. Thousands. C. Tens of thousands. D. Hundreds of thousands. E. Millions. Correct answer. E. Millions. And those millions of people seem to be A. Slightly annoyed. B. Seemingly irritated. C. Definitely angry. D. Insane with fury. Correct answer. D. Insane with fury. Consider what they had done. They had taken as hostage diplomats of the United States of America, the world's most powerful country. It must have been obvious to them. It still must be obvious to them. We could easily send one of our aircraft carriers off their coast. I think at least recently we've had two of their aircraft carriers off their coast and bomb them right back into the Stone Age. Am I the only one here who remembers John McCain singing during that presidential election when he was running, bomb, 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 Iran. 
right back into the Stone Age. And when the people of Iran realized what danger they could be in from the exercise of America's military strength against them, did they contritely apologize to us? Oh, here you Americans have your embassy diplomats back. We took them hostage in a moment of hot-headedness and haste, and I guess we really don't hate your guts so much. Let's let bygones be bygones. Never. They have continued to be as hostile as possible to kidnap our citizens, blow up our airliners, attack our soldiers. And so I like to point out it should be obvious when so many people become so extremely angry, chances are something really bad must have happened to all of those people to make them become so extremely angry. I remember hearing one of the Iranian government officials saying back in 1979 on Meet the Press, the American people must believe either that all Iranians are crazy or the American people should believe there's something they're not being told. As soon as he said that, it struck me like thunder in my brain. Yeah, they got me believing these people are all a bunch of crazy Muslims. I wonder what he means, what we haven't been told. The rest of this lecture is really my research into the answer to this question. We, that is to say the Dulleses, oil company lawyers, moved in, kicked out their democratically elected leader, Mohammed Mossadegh, whose only crime is he wants to use Iran's wealth and oil for the benefit of the people of Iran. It's their oil, after all. The oil companies hate him. Their lawyers, the Dulleses, kick out Mossadegh, install the Shah, U.S.-friendly dictator, keeps the price of low, keeps the price of oil low. We're all happy. Cheap oil, cheap gas. I love it. Everyone in Iran very unhappy. They'll be poor forever. Their children will be poor forever. Complain that we did this to them, taken away, tortured, and killed by the Shah's dreaded secret police, trained by the CIA, acronymed Savak. And just so... And just so we're all on the same page, one of Savak's most notorious torture techniques, if they really didn't like you and wanted not only to shut you up but to scare all your friends into shutting up also, they would kill you by giving you an enema with boiling water, boiling water through the anus into the lower intestine. And I remember once when I was giving this lecture, a student put up their hand and immediately shot out, Professor, with what was at stake here? Wouldn't you think it was more appropriate that they used boiling oil? With stealing the oil, shouldn't they use boiling oil? And before I could even think of how I was going to respond, another student yelled out, No, oil is too expensive. Water is cheaper. These are capitalist corporations. They want to keep the cost down. Nice to keep your sense of humor about these things, but I'll read you now from a source that mentions the Savak and the Shah. 1953 was a busy year for Alan Dulles, even as he readied the CIA for a coup in Guatemala. I'll give that lecture later. His agents were toppling the government of Dr. Mohammed Mossadegh and paving the way for the Shah. With Dulles' encouragement, the Shah made the Iranian people an offer they couldn't refuse, join his party or go to jail. Thousands who refused to yield were imprisoned or murdered. During regional elections in 1954, the Shah's agents raided a religious school and hurled hundreds of students to their death from the roof. His regime received 100% of the vote that year, an election which registered more votes than there were voters. The Shah's subsequent solidification of power led to an iron-fisted rule and forced by fear and torture. His secret police agency, Savak, was created and managed by the CIA at all levels of daily operation, including the choice and organization of personnel, selection and operations of equipment, the running of agents. Savak's torture methods included electric shock, whipping, beating, inserting broken glass into the rectum, I missed that one, pouring boiling water into the rectum, tying weights to the testicles, and extraction of teeth and nails. And so I have always liked to ask my classes, if somebody did something like that to one of your loved ones, your mother, your father, your children, do you think maybe you would be willing to strap yourself with dynamite, get behind the wheel of a truck loaded with dynamite, and go on a suicide mission against soldiers from the enemy country in the world responsible for doing this to your loved ones? You want me to go out on a suicide mission now? Are you crazy? I don't want to die. But if somebody did something like that to my mother or father or child, maybe that would make me crazy enough to want to do it. My favorite quotation here from Andre Malraux's book, Man's Fate, 
apologies for the sexism and French le condition humaine, one of my favorite sentences, the sons of torture victims make good terrorists. That is who would do something like that. The sons of torture victims make good terrorists. And I don't mean that to be sexist, by the way. I am sure you daughters of torture victims also could make good terrorists. I know you ladies have it in you to terrorize. You know how I know that? I get terrorized by female drivers on the freeway every single day. Ask me how I came up with that one. But now a quotation from the national enemy, Osama bin Laden. I clipped this out. I believe it was from Newsweek back in 1999, two years before 9-11. I clipped this out. Back then I had to explain to people who Osama bin Laden is, was, haven't had to do that lately. I've lost part of this, or I would have it in the video for you, but it reads from Osama bin Laden, they violate our land, occupy it, steal the Muslims' possessions, and when faced by resistance, they call it terrorism. Osama bin Laden, the Saudi millionaire U.S. officials blame for the 1998 bombings of the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, calling for a holy war against the infidel 1999. They violate our land, occupy it, steal the Muslims' possessions. And if you want to know what he means by the Muslims' possessions, of course, oil. This one of my former students got for me. Thank you for my former students for doing my research for me. That's what students are for Osama bin Laden, letter to America. I didn't get the letter. Did you get the letter? He writes here, you steal our wealth and oil at paltry prices. You steal our wealth and oil at very cheap prices because of your international influence and military threats. Bomb, 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 Iran. This theft is indeed the biggest theft ever witnessed by mankind in the history of the world. When I first read that, this is indeed the biggest theft ever witnessed by mankind in the history of the world, I thought to myself, oh, he's got to be exaggerating, our enemies exaggerate, there's got to be some time in human history a bigger theft, wouldn't you think? But then I started to consider all the oil we have taken out of the Middle East in the last 100, 150 years, what this has meant to the world. We build all of our modern industrial economies by stealing their oil cheap. Maybe it is the biggest theft ever witnessed by mankind in the history of the world. But note what he says. They steal our wealth and oil. They violate our land, occupy and steal our oil. When faced by resistance, they call it terrorism. He doesn't say, oh, I hate your freedom, oh, land of the free man, do I hate freedom. You guys let women go to school. You let women drive cars. We don't do that in Saudi Arabia. You know you guys are stupid. Women are going to get college degrees. They're going to get driver's licenses. They're not going to need you. They're going to drive away and leave you. Well, that's not what he says. If it was our freedom he didn't like, then I've wondered over the years, why didn't they try to fly one of those planes into the Statue of Liberty. That's the symbol of America's freedom. And if you know your New York geography, and I was born in the Bronx, the Statue of Liberty is virtually right next to the World Trade Center. Manhattan is a rectangle, and the World Trade Center way down in lower Manhattan, right next to New York Harbor. I think one of the King Kong movies, they're coming in over the harbor. There's the World Trade Center. My father took me to the top, by the way, as soon as it opened, and right out in the middle of New New York Harbor, the Statue of Liberty, maybe two miles away, three miles away, at the speed a commercial airliner flies, a relatively few seconds. Statue of Liberty is a big thing, sticking up out of the water, straight shot, nothing in your way. If it was our freedom they didn't like, why didn't they try to fly a plane into the Statue of Liberty? That's the symbol of America's freedom. They flew that plane into the World Trade Center. What's that? the symbol of. That's the symbol of the multinational corporations that control the world, stole from, and tortured their people. And by the way, since I'm saying, you know, the current state of U.S. relations with Iran, their supreme leader now is Khamenei. 
I've heard people, students, tell me they thought that was the same as Khomeini, who led the revolution back in 1979. That was Khomeini. This is Khamenei. And I found this when I was at the dentist. This is from a Time Magazine article. A Time Magazine article. I don't get Time Magazine, so I found this at the dentist. And a very nice picture here of the Ayatollah Khamenei. The passage is called In the Shah's Dungeon. It was Khomeini who branded America the Great Satan and instilled a hatred for the West among his followers. Khamenei didn't need persuading. By the time of the revolution in 1979, he had already been jailed six times by, Amer by Iran's pro-American monarch, Shah Ritza Pahlavi. While the Shah had a glamorous image in the West, he was a thug at home, reinstalled in a 1953 CIA-led coup, and protected by a U.S.-trained secret police with a record of brutal torture, torture that Khamenei experienced himself firsthand. Visitors to a former interrogation center at a prison where he was held in solitary confinement, now an anti-Shah museum, can see a portrait of a young Khamenei with a black beard, shortly cropped hair, and thick glasses, and a video in which he describes how an interrogator for the secret police Savak once poured alcohol on his beard and set it on fire. That's what the secret police of Ak we trained to help us steal Iran's oil did to the current supreme leader, Khamenei, poured alcohol on his beard and set it on fire. Why they don't like us very much. And this piece, very precious to me because of where this comes from, much different source than Osama bin Laden. This is Dr. Robert M. Bowman. Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Air Force, retired, mentions here Dr. Bowman has held high positions in both Democratic and Republican administrations, directed all the Star Wars programs under Presidents Ford and Carter, flew 101 combat missions in Vietnam. He ain't no sissy. Flew 101 combat missions in Vietnam. Ph.D. in aeronautics and nuclear engineering from Caltech. Ph.D. in aeronautics and nuclear engineering from Caltech, why he's Dr. Robert Bowman, president of the Institute for Space and Security Studies and presiding archbishop of something called the United Catholic Church. This is not said to President Bush. This really is written to President Clinton. Tell the American people the truth, Mr. President, about terrorism, not about poor Monica. If your lies about terrorism go unchallenged, the terror war that has been unleashed will continue until it destroys us. Mr. President, you did not tell the American people the truth about why we are the targets of terrorism. You said that we are the target because we stand for freedom, democracy, and human rights in the world. Baloney, the lieutenant colonel says. We are the target of terrorism because we stand for dictatorship bondage and human exploitation in the world. We are the target of terrorists because we are hated, and we are hated because our government has done hateful things. In how many countries have we deposed popularly elected leaders and replaced them with puppet military dictators who are willing to sell out their own people to American multinational corporations? First case he cites, we did it in Iran when we deposed Mossadegh because he wanted to nationalize the oil industry, use the profits for the nation, the people of Iran. We replaced him with the Shah and trained, armed, and paid his hated Savak National Guard, which enslaved and brutalized the people of Iran, all to protect the financial interests of our oil companies and the very possibility of our modern industrial economies, which depend so completely on our having uninterrupted access to their oil at a cheap price. We trained, armed, and paid his hated Savak National Guard, enslaved and brutalized the people of Iran, all to protect our own financial interests. Is it any wonder there are people in Iran who hate us, the great Satan? They think we love money, the root of all evil. One more passage from this. It goes on for pages, by the way. 
Maybe I'll do the lectures on Central America. And of course, how many times have we done it in Nicaragua and all the other banana republics of Latin America? Time after time, we have ousted popular leaders who wanted the riches of the land to be shared by the people who worked it. We replaced them with murderous tyrants who would sell out and control their own people so that the wealth of their land could be taken out by Domino Sugar, United Fruit Company, Folgers, and Chiquita Banana. In country after country, our government has thwarted democracy, stifled freedom, and trampled human rights. That's why we are hated around the world, and that's why we are the target of terrorism. I'd like to give a salute to Lieutenant Colonel Robert Bowman.